And hello, friends. We welcome you to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm your host, Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We're delighted to have short story writer and teacher Natalie Seipolt with us here today. She lives and writes in West Virginia, and her work has appeared in uh, literary journals such as Glimmer Train, Appalachian Heritage, Still the Journal, Switchback, Ardor Literary Magazine, Superstition Review, Paste, Willow Springs Review, The Kenyon Review on Online, among other fine journals. She's the winner of the Glimmer Train Writers Contest, the Betty Geberhart Prize, the West Virginia Fiction Award, and the Still Fiction Contest. She's also an active book reviewer whose work has appeared in the Los Angeles Review, Shenandoah, Harper Pallet, and Mid-American Review. Additionally, she serves as the literary editor for the Anthology of Appalachian Writers. She's on the selection committee for the prestigious Weatherford Award in Fiction, participates in the Women of Appalachia Project, which is a juried reading series, and coordinates the West Virginia High School Workshop for the West Virginia Writers Workshop at WVU. She currently works as an assistant professor at Pierpont Community and Technical College. She lives with some hound dogs and cats as well, <laughs> and we're here to talk to her about her debut short story collection, The Sounds of Holding Your Breath, and we're delighted to have Natalie Seipolt with us here today. Natalie, welcome Thanks. to Chapter. So good to see you. Thank you for having me, Elliot. I'm really, I, I, I loved your short story collection, and I can't wait to, to talk about that and some of the stories today, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about something first that I saw on your acknowledgments page, which caught my attention. Okay. And you wrote about how, throughout my life, I've always loved books in all forms and have been fortunate enough to surround myself and been surrounded with words. But you also thanked someone named Gail Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, who is Gail Adams and why was that relationship or is that relationship important to you? Sure, that relationship's all been very important to me. Gail was um, my first creative writing teacher at WVU when I was an undergraduate. Um, I started as a psychology major at WVU um, and had planned on just taking some creative writing classes kind of on the side. And the first class I walked into was hers. And she's crazy, you know, she's very eclectic. Do you know Gail? Yes, right. I do. Right, so you understand. Um, but just, like, this, the warmest, most caring lady. She would um, bring a giant bag packed of stuff, and just on the first day we'd, like, unpack it just to show you things that she liked, you know, just things that she loved. And I think she was the first teacher who I ever had who, you know, I had lots of great teachers, and my mom's a teacher, so I had lots of great teachers in my life. But she was the first teacher who I could tell her personality as well, you know, like she really put a lot of herself into her classes and um, she saw something in me and fostered that. I was not the best writer in that class by any stretch, but she saw that there was something and, you know, she wanted to kind of support me and um, I've been so lucky to have the support of her and other Appalachian writers throughout my career that is really, you know, just who, the, who supported me for no reason other than they just wanted to support me. So you know? what does she think about you now with your short story collection? Now? I have not talked to her for a little while. She's in Texas now and she was in the process of moving so I'm not exactly sure at which location to find her. Um, she was really proud. She was really excited and she had been telling me for a long time to send it out and um, I just hadn't done it. So she was really happy and you know she's always proud of me and so many of her other former students who she keeps in touch with. Um, we write letters. She is an avid letter writer. She doesn't really do the email, but she wants to send cards and things like that. And um, I send her pictures of my dogs sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't. I need to catch up with her. Actually, I haven't talked to her for a little while. I want to send her a book, but I'm, I wasn't sure which place she was living at. So sure. as soon as I figure that out, I'm going to send her one. Well, great. Sounds mm -hmm. sounds like a great relationship. Yeah. And and I think a, a lot of writers can at least pinpoint at least one of those mm -hmm. kind of relationships, somebody right. that influenced them or inspired them. Well, and them it's so that. interesting how many people can pinpoint Gail. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I recently met Nancy Abrams, who is another WVU Press author. She um, wrote a book called Up From Salt Lick. And it's nonfiction about the time that she lived in um, a place in Preston County called Salt Lake, and she was a local reporter, and she was kind of an, an outsider writing, you know, local inside news. And I heard her speak at um, the book festival in Charleston, and one of the first people she mentioned was Gail Adams, who <laughs> was her friend in Morgantown and who always supported her and told her to write. So that was really interesting to me that, you know, it's like the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, except it's with Gail Adams, right? right Everybody absolutely. sort of has a connection with her. <laughs> Yeah, she's she's a great person. I'm so she is. and I'm so glad that to, to see you mention her in your acknowledgement mm -hmm. section. Um, this is a great collection of stories, and, and I know yeah. uh, you've some of these you've been working on for a while. But um, mm -hmm. what are some of the common themes that connected these stories in this collection? Mm -hmm. well, certainly, place. They're all um, 
centered in West Virginia, most of them in like North Central West Virginia, the places where I, I've lived. Um, and I think that place is a very important theme in most Appalachian writing, the connection to the place and the connection to family. Uh, I would also say perseverance is something that um, I think that a lot of my characters, you know, they're faced with difficult circumstances, but they're f they are forced to persevere or give up. And, you know, West Virginians don't really want to give up, so they persevere. <laughs> right. I think that's a strong theme. I think rural living is probably a theme. Certainly in many of my stories, I, I make jokes and say that they're a little murdery because they, they're a little murdery. <laughs> There's elements of, um, of crime, um, violence, I suppose. I feel weird saying that because I, I feel like, for me, those were never things that I thought a lot about as being themes. But when I read reviews of the book, those are always the things that the reviewers point to. And I think that's interesting because for me, they were about, the stories are about family and friendships and how you get through difficult situations and how you learn to kind of come into yourself and overcome. And I had never really thought about them as being these violent stories. I, I believe the first review I read said something like, here someone stabbed and over here someone's drowned and there's violence everywhere. <laughs> it's like, that makes me sound like a very different writer than what I am, but I guess I guess it's true on that basic level. But, but, the, but these these things happen because you know, as you mentioned, a lot a lot of your characters are, are isolated and living kind of in rural sort sort of what we call consider or think about backwoods, you know, hollers, or so to speak, mm -hmm. to use a pejorative. Um, so these things happen, you know, that people do drown and people mm -hmm. are able to inflict violence on others because you're not in an area where people can always notice that. So it sure. seems like you know, that's a part of our Appalachian right. culture that oftentimes people don't want to think about sure. or, or reflect on. Right. Well, and I think that those things happen everywhere. It's just the way that the people can see them and deal with them is maybe different depending on where you're living. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, so one of the themes that seems to come up in your work is this, this theme of identity, that some are trying to define what it means for them um, in terms of their identity to themselves or their identity with their families and relationships, but some people are trying to escape it. Talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that, about kind of the dichotomy that some of your characters are going through with this idea of identity. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I don't know that most of the characters realize that that's what they're facing, right? Cause we seldom do when we're in those situations. Um, I think a lot of them are kind of coming of age stories in some ways where they're, you know, at a certain point of their life where they're trying to figure out are they going to stay or are they going to go, right? And what does it mean to stay? And I think that sometimes that decision about what it means to stay does define your identity because if you stay, you have to maybe become a different kind of person. Right? You have to accept that these are the people that your family is and either you're going to be part of them or you're going to not know them. Right? Like in um, My Brothers and Me, right? the main character kind of works in university. She works away from her family. But when tragedy happens in her family, she has to go back to that. So you know, it's that idea of being able to be part of and not part of. And at certain times, you're going to have to decide which one of those things you're going to be. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that I really think a lot about that myself when I write. I think it's just those are themes probably that permeate my life mm -hmm. as somebody who grew up in a very rural area but also, you know, chose to kind of go into academia mm -hmm. but also not to leave the state. You know, it was very important to me to be able to stay in the state as long as I could. Um, it was important to me to have my first book published by a regional press if I could, and I was lucky enough that WVU Press wanted to to take that on, so, but then it also has taken me outside of the state a lot. Sure. And I think that it's interesting to see how, how readers will take these stories inside and outside. People see it very differently, I think, right? So it gives you a lot of good feedback then as a writer when, when you see mm -hmm. kind of the, the in-state or the regional perspective versus maybe a mm -hmm. perspective from somebody in Pittsburgh or North Carolina or somewhere like that, right? Right, I mean, it's, it's good, it's interesting, but I'm not sure it's stuff that we can really care too much about. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't mean that in an unkind way, but you know, you can't think, I'm going to now write this story for the Pittsburgh reader, and I'm going to right. now write this story for the Texas reader, because it just doesn't work that way, you know? Yeah. I think the most that we can do is just tell the truth, and tell the truth the way that we see it. It's our truth, that's why somebody would want to read our story. Mm -hmm. So, if they don't understand it, 
then they can come and talk to me about it, I guess. Very <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. um, and I know something else I really liked about your collection, too. A lot of the stories have young adult narrators. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about why you chose young adult narrators and, and, and put them kind of as the forefront uh, mm -hmm. of your storytelling? Sure. Um, well, I think that that's a really important part of people's lives. It's a very formative part. We all know it's a very formative part. Um, identity is interesting to me, as we said, and I think that's a time in your life when you're really trying to decide your identity and figure out who you are. Um, for most of us, I think that we probably are doing that always throughout our lives, but maybe that's when it really starts, when you start thinking about, um, you know, who am I? What does it mean to be part of this place and this family? Also, I don't really think about it that much. I think it's just those are the stories, the way that the stories came to me, and it was it just made sense for them to be those characters at that time. Um, I like young adult narrators. I like to read those books. One of my favorite books is True Grit, mm -hmm. um, and that, the voice of that narrator, which is a strong, interesting voice, um, full of dialect, but not dialect and dialogue that bothers you, which mm -hmm. is also, I think, something that's really important. But it's just her voice that tells you who she is and tells you the story. Yeah, very right. good. Excellent. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I like the narrator in, in True Grit, too, because there's some wisdom there when, when mm -hmm. you when you pay attention to the dialogue and what she's saying mm -hmm. and what she's saying to certain people about other people, right. that there's kernels of wisdom there. And I, yeah. I found that with a lot of your young adult narrators, too, that, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you read and kind of, sometimes you have to read the stories twice, which mm -hmm. is which is great, but if you kind of pay attention to, mm -hmm. to not just what they're saying, but how they're saying it and the language that they're using, there, there's some kernels mm -hmm. of wisdom there mm -hmm. in those young adult narrators, which is mm -hmm. really interesting. Well, and I think that's true if we listen to young people. That's true in real life, right? And we see that, we've seen that, um, so often now with the, the kids after the shooting in, in Florida, was it Florida? Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? The shooting in Florida and, you know, the kids who have spoken out and spoken up and right now they're the ones who are making the most sense a lot of times, the young people, and we probably should listen to them more. Yep. And I work with the high schoolers in the summertime and, you know, they're some of my very favorite people to be around because they're fun, but also they know what this, what, how the seriousness of situations and they understand that, you know, the decisions they make now are going to affect them for a long time. And yeah. um, I really admire some of those kids who have, you know, faced hard times, diversity in their lives, but are still finding ways to express their art and to be beautiful. And, you know, yeah. I think we should listen to them more. Absolutely. A lot more wisdom there than people give credit for, mm -hmm. that's for sure. There's two stories I wanted to ask you about, uh, two that I really loved in the collection. I loved every story, but there's two Thank I really you. loved. The one story, Lettuce, I mm -hmm. really, really liked. Um, we have a character named Jenny. We also have another character named Matt. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> but one of the threads or one of the of developments that happens there is Jenny decides to serve Matt a bloody knuckle salad, <laughs> which I, I loved. I just loved that, and, and I didn't see that coming until the end of the story. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about Jenny and Matt's you know relationship mm -hmm. without you know trying not to make you give too much away? But what's going on there between those two? Uh, well, so that story, my friends do affectionately call that the bloody knuckle salad story. <laughs> so that's funny. Um, that story was actually inspired by the C.D. Wright poem that I excerpted from for my epigraph. Um, which is a poem called Everything Good Between Men and Women. And the poem is about um, sort of like the dark parts of relationships, like the, um, the ugly parts, like one has a fever blister and, you know, like that, that kind of thing, but um, how they still love each other through the kind of gross everyday things, right? So, but there was a line in it that was something like save the, save the lettuce, right? So that was originally the title of that story. Um, and I think this story is about people who are trying to reach each other but can't figure out ways, right? And, you know, it seems, I think it seems like a, a mean thing that she does because he's now a vegetarian, right? And she's feeding him blood. Um, that sounds really terrible, but <laughs> I, I think that if you look at it a different way, it's, you know, maybe the only way that she is able to connect with him now, right? She eats the salad too, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, sh they've been together since they were high schoolers, but he's gone through changes in his life while she sort of stayed there and stayed the same. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to find ways to just connect with each other, even if they're ways that aren't necessarily pretty. Yeah, right? it, it, it was great. And, and they are, 
they are so different, as you mentioned, characters for those reasons that you mentioned, that he's had some changes and she's kind of been static and always there. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I kind of felt like they were two characters that deserved one another. I mean, they may be at times miserable together, but I can't see them not with each other at the mm-hmm. same time, which I thought was right. interesting. So, um, And then the title story, The Sound of Holding Your Breath. Uh, we have a death kind of in that <laughs> in that story, going back to what you were talking about, murdery. about violence, a little, a little murdery murdering. there. Um, and we have two characters there, Marley and Rob, who are involved. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you kind of to, to kind of describe their relationship, but, you know, Marley kind of has some responsibility in what happens to Rob. Can you talk a little bit mm-hmm. about that too? Sure. Um, so I wanted it to kind of remain ambiguous at the end. Um, if she knew, so it was an accidental, it was an accidental death, right? Her husband accidentally pushed him off the porch and he smashed his head against a stone sculpture. And it's framed that it's accidental. Certainly the husband, her husband believes it's accidental. But I wanted it to be a little ambiguous as to whether or not she knew that he was behind Rob when she started screaming, therefore instigated the fight that ultimately led to him falling off the porch. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of good and evil with characters. I think too often we make it seem very easy that this character is all good and this character is all evil. And I didn't want her in this story to seem like a a victim, even though she is a victim in some ways. And I didn't want her to seem like the poor martyred victim who is all good. Mm -hmm. So I wanted there to be kind of an edge to her character. And I, I... hope that that was true that you know she came across as a complex person and not you know just the poor martyred young woman who was involved in this terrible situation at the end yeah it, it, it's a great story mm-hmm. to follow and, and and again like you said you know you're not quite sure whether when you get to the end you know how you feel about really everybody but but mm-hmm. her especially you're exactly right yeah. so out of all the stories in your collection which one did you find was the easiest to write and which one was mm-hmm. the hardest to write <laughs> None of them are easy or hard. (laughs) Um, I will say that both My Brothers and Me and Lettuce came pretty quickly. I like it when you can sit down and write and the the whole story will kind of come right then in that one sitting because it has like the same energy behind it if you can write it all at one time. Um, And both of those, those are really two of the three stories that I can trace exactly where they came from. Like I know that um, Lettuce came from that poem. That was my original inspiration. I know that my brothers and me came directly from things that were happening in my area and the news at that time. Um, so in that way, I think those were easier, right? And I have, didn't have to revise them very much. Um, my brothers and me, I wrote, I revised it a little. It was time for the Glimmer Train deadline, so I sent it, thinking this is really bad of me not to work <laughs> on this more not following my own rules that I give my students, but I did it, and then I won that contest. So who knows, you know. Um, The hardest one, I would say, is probably Wanting Baby, which is a story I wrote a long time ago and just keep revising and sending out and getting it rejected and (laughs) revising it and sending it out and getting it rejected. So um, I think that one has been kind of a struggle. I never read that one when I do public readings even though people tell me that, that they really like that story, and I've even, like, my friends have even said, read that one. I'm like, no, it's bad. You know? <laughs> so that one I still don't feel really at peace with yeah. for whatever reason. I don't know why. I think I had a bad workshop experience mm-hmm. when I was in grad school and somebody said some mean things to me, and, I, and for whatever reason I just can't ever like, get that. You, you know, you've been in workshops. Absolutely. Sometimes that happens and you just can't get past it in that yeah. way. So. Yeah, it kind of puts a permanent scarlet letter on mm-hmm. that story. Yeah. And that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, you know, when you write short stories or you're really writing in general, mm-hmm. uh, when do you feel like you know that it's it, it's done? I know you mentioned the Glimmer Train story mm-hmm. and, and the baby story, but, um, you know, at what point is your drafting or revising or maybe going through the second or third revision, do, mm-hmm. do you feel like it, it, it's as good as it's going to be or if I keep tinkering with it anymore, mm-hmm. I'm going to ruin the quality. You know, wh- how do you reach that point? When do you know yeah. that, that you've, you've done all you can do with that story? I don't. Just whenever I send it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess that that's still something that I probably am growing to understand in my own writing. I re- I've still relied probably too much on outside feedback. Like, if it's accepted, it must be done, right? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when I go to publish the book, I do more with it, you know, it's not done. So I think in some ways we'll probably, I probably never will feel like they're done. Um, but when I can read through and I can find the heart of the story and I can like kind of draw those lines and know where 
I can start to see that that heart is coming through, and that's clear to me. And I can give it to my friend, who is a trusted reader, and she can read it without getting any information from me beforehand and also know. Mm -hmm. And I think probably I'm getting close. Who are some writers that influence your work? Mm -hmm. So lots of people. Um, modern writers, living writers I love. I love Silas House, of course. Um, I love Robert Guype lately and Trampoline. I think he's doing the young adult. He did the young adult voice of Don Absolutely. so well in that book. And he's doing kind of some interesting things with, you know, collaborating the or bringing together the visuals with the words. And he's also just a really funny guy in general. Um, and Pancake, of course, always. Even though I can never write like her, I, I love to read her work. And I just love her in general. Yeah. She's a great person. She is. Uh, Laura Long was really important to me as we're, and we're writing this book. She read my whole draft and told me to send it out because she was seeing that I wasn't sending it out. So she was like, let me read it. And, and she's like, now you must send it. You know? I'm like, okay, I'll do it because you told me to. <laughs> uh, sometimes that's what we need, right? We right. need somebody to tell us to do it. Um, I really love William Gay, who is not a living writer um, and writes very dark, dark fiction. Um, I like his novels a lot. Um, Daniel Woodrell, who does a lot of what they call now like the redneck noir, right, like Winter's Bone. I think he's a good, creepy writer. Um, he reminds me a lot of David Joy. He's, yeah. He's kind of doing yeah. that, that, that yeah, same yeah. kind of genre. Yeah. Um, I like Karen Russell a lot, who does magical realism. She also does really good young adult narrators. Not anything I will, I will write, so I don't do like the magical realism stuff, but I love to read it, and I think she's really the master of that short story form right now. Very good. Yeah. So what is Natalie Seipolt working on next? That's a good question. Right now I'm working on getting through Christmas. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm working on a collection of linked stories that I've been working on for a long time that is probably done, but I keep feeling like there needs to be one more story. And I know that there doesn't, but um, I need, probably need somebody to tell me, Natalie, there does not need to be any more stories here. You're done. <laughs> and I have a novel that I've like written a few pages of that that's going to eventually be my project as soon as I get done with the story collection in 10 or 15 years. <laughs> can, can you give us any hints on that novel, what, what, what you're doing um, or what you're working with? No, not the novel because I don't feel like I can voice, I don't feel like I can voice it yet, but the collection of stories is actually um, the same characters that are in the very last story of this book, which is um, Stalking the White Deer. So, um, those characters are the parents of the main characters in the collection of stories. So that book does kind of connect to this one. Very good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So in our final minutes with you today, Natalie, if someone wants to get in contact with you to talk to you about your writing or your, your career mm -hmm. or get a copy of The Sound of Holding Your Breath, how can they get in contact with you and then where can they get copies of your book? Sure. So um, my website is probably the best way to get in contact with me. It's just nataliesipolt.com. Um, my email address is natalie.sipold at gmail.com. I'd be happy to email. Um, and probably the best place to get the book, if you can't, go to your local bookstore. Um, hopefully your local bookstores will carry it. Uh, would be to order directly from the press. And they've actually been having a Bah Humbug sale where you can get 30% off all of their titles, um, I think up until New Year's maybe. Right. So. That'd probably be the best way. Excellent. Natalie Seipolt has been our guest here today on Chapters. We've been talking to her about her career as a writer. We've been talking to her about her outstanding debut short story collection, The Sound of Holding Your Breath, which is out from WVU Press. Uh, Natalie, it's a great collection of stories. It's Thank it's you. just it's wonderful in so many ways, and congratulations on it. And as you get that next uh, set of uh, braided stories to, uh, written and published, we'll be glad to have you on to talk about it. So right. thanks, thanks so much so for much. coming on. Thanks for having me. We also want to take a moment to thank the staff and management of the Inner Geek here at Pullman Square for providing our on-site support and assistance today. Please come down to the Inner Geek and ask about Natalie's book and pick up a copy of that uh, to satisfy your reading taste or any other reading taste of someone that you might know. And we like to remind you that many of the author, editor, and publishers that you've seen featured here on the program have their works for sale right here at the Inner Geek at Pullman Square. So come on down and visit with them and check out those titles. If you've got a question, comment, or story suggestion about this program or any chapters program that you've seen here on Armstrong Television, we've made it possible for you to stay in contact with us through a variety of social media platforms. The first is our email address. That is right here at the bottom of the screen. 
please do let us know your name and town or the name and community in which you're writing from so that we can track that correspondence. We also have an Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube. That address is right here at the bottom of the screen where all of our author, editor, and publisher interviews are archived there. And if you're a Facebook user, we also have a chapters page on Facebook, and that address is here at the bottom of the screen. What we have on our Facebook page is our more recent author, editor, and publisher interviews archived there on the Facebook platform, and so you can like those, share those to your Facebook page or your other social media platforms that you have connected to Facebook, interact with members of the program and viewers of the program through Facebook. So whatever social media format you like, we've made it possible for you to keep up with what's going on here on the program. We know many of you have done that. We appreciate all the comments and feedback uh, that we do receive through those. And that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community. Thank you.